let's record this. So for the rest of the quarter, we're going to start getting into fracture mechanics. So everything we're going to be talking about, so all, all the topics we'll be talking about for the next um, three-ish weeks will be s around that topic. So first we'll go through stress concentrations, which is kind of the backbone of um, how fracture mechanics works. And that the, uh, your lab next week will be looking at the stress concentration around a hole in a plate using digital image correlation. And so next week on Monday, I'll go through some of the theory for digital image correlation and how that actually works so that when you see it in the lab, you'll know what's going on to some degree. Um, stress concentrations directly lead into fracture. So um, basically when you have some sort of imperfection in a material, which all materials do to, to some degree, um, that imperfection in a brittle material generally leads to failure. In ductile materials, you actually get the formation of failure points that lead to fracture. And so um, in the Myers and Chala book, this is now chapter seven and chapter eight. Chapter seven goes through all of the, the theoretical macroscopic fracture aspects. And then chapter eight, which I think they do a really good job on, goes through the microscopic aspects of fracture. So when you see the, the tension lab experiment, uh, you see the roughness of the surface. That's actually a fracture driven process. Um, and so chapter eight does a really good job explaining that. And I'll touch on it a little bit in the class, but I won't go into too much detail on it because there's a lot of things to consider. Um, I'll go through Bible statistics a bit, maybe like a day or so on that, which is um, I'll, I'll give the teaser of if I have a, a long rope or a short rope, and I pull on them, which one do you think is going to fail at a lower load? Um, and so it's very relevant for fiber composites. And when you did that uniaxial fiber uh, tension test, you heard all the ding, 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 like all the fibers pinging off. Um, that has to do with Weibull statistics. So um, we'll go through some of that. Uh, then finally, at the very end, we'll go through fatigue. So when you start loading a part over and over and over and over again, it gradually weakens. And that weakening process is actually a fracture driven process. So it has to do with the accumulation of defects in a material that then cause that weakening. And so the next three weeks, we're going to go through all of that. Um, I think it's, it's, it's probably one of the most important parts of materials, uh, mechanics of materials, because it, it kind of helps round out all of the stuff that we've been seeing and looking at in the past few sections. Um, cool. So with that, first, I'm going to talk about stress concentrations. And I have 10 minutes left. Cool. So I'm not going to talk about much. Um, so stress concentrations. So for this, what uh, for this instance in particular, we're going to be looking at a semi-infinite plate. So I'm going to draw a wiggly line here. Uh, just take this to mean that the plate keeps going off to infinity. And I'm going to be applying some far field load to it, um, some far field load sigma far away, so sigma at infinity. And I want to look at what, if I have now a hole in that plate, I want to figure out what the stress concentrations are around this hole. So as a first guess, I'm going to see what your thoughts are. Um, where do you think the areas of highest stress and lowest stress around this hole in a plate might be? So highest here, high, and lowest on the horizontal. Is this because you've now looked ahead into the materials? OK, that's a good guess. <laughs> yeah. So here, the, the simplest case that we can analyze, which I guess you can get analytic, uh, analytic relations for all of these things, but the simplest case you can analyze is for a, a hole, a circular hole. And so you'll, yes, you will get a high stress here and a low stress here. Um, <coughs> interestingly, you'll actually get a negative stress. Uh, so it's going to be so low that it actually turns negative. But before we talk about that, all of the analysis that I'll be talking about is in polar coordinates. So I wanted to give a quick uh, 
maybe a refresher, maybe intro uh, on what polar coordinates are. Polar coordinates. So before, uh, when we had been looking at stress in a body, we'd been taking it in a Cartesian sense. So we'd been taking a block of stuff in here and looking at that block we had stress in the X, stress in the Y, shear, shear, so sigma X, sigma Y, sigma X, Y. Um, now for fracture problems and for stress concentration problems, it turns out to be a lot more convenient to look at things in polar coordinates. So what I, I'm actually going to do is look relative to a point in space, um, I'm going to draw a ring around this. And in that ring, what I now want to look at is the stress at some distance away from a point in that coordinate system. So now in this coordinate system, I have something like this. I'm going to draw this slightly exaggerated. Uh, and I'm going to define, or I'm going to say that I have now the stress is there, still drawing them the same way, but I'm going to define them differently. I'm going to have a radial stress, so sigma RR is my radial stress. Uh, hoop stress, so sigma theta theta, so this is a radial stress. This is a hoop stress, because it's acting along this ring, so it's acting along a hoop. Uh, and then I still have the, the shear, so sigma r theta, which is still just a shear. But now shear relative to, to that axis. And these are acting at some distance r away from a particular reference point. So in Cartesian coordinates, we had some origin, some x and y that we were looking relative to. Now we have still a central point, but we're looking at things in terms of now an r and a theta. Let's move this over, r, and then some theta there. So now I, I'm describing my problem in terms of r and theta relative to, to a point and to some axis theta equals zero. So for that, there's a couple, uh, first for coordinate transforms, so coordinate transforms. Uh, I can say my r is equal to square root of x squared plus y squared uh, to figure out position-wise where I am. So if I give you a point x and y in space, uh, you can figure out what the distance is to that point based on that. And I can say my theta is inverse tangent or arctan of y over x. So this is how, if, you, if I give you a point in space, you'd figure out your r and your theta. Then the stress is now uh, relative to those. So the stress is relative to my Cartesian stresses. Uh, you can go through, plug in coordinate transforms, add in some, some of the stress transformations that we had done before, and come up with a relationship for polar stresses relative to Cartesian, or stresses in polar coordinates relative to stresses in Cartesian coordinates. And these are kind of long, gross equations that are going to be somewhat familiar uh, based on our coordinate transformation equations. That's sigma y, y, sine squared of theta, two sigma x, y, sine of theta, cosine of theta, sigma r, uh, let's theta theta is x sine plus y cosine minus 2 x y sine cosine and then the shear sigma r theta is y minus x sine, cosine, uh, shear, x, y, 
cosine squared minus sine squared. There we go. So they're kind of a big, long, ugly set of coordinate transformations to get to our stress and our, our uh, polar coordinates. And I'm going to show you one example really quick for uh, stress in a uniaxial state, what that looks like. So what we're going to be looking at for our analysis is that uh, stress generally in one direction, in one dimension, one direction, uh, at, a, at an infinite distance away. So if we wanted to take some of these coordinate transform equations and say now the stress in a uniaxial, in a single body, some sigma infinity, I know that my stress in my Cartesian coordinates is just sigma infinity and then zeros, or sigma x is equal to sigma infinity and everything else is zero. Uh, in Cartesian, or in polar coordinates now, if I were to plug that in, my sigma r is sigma infinity cosine squared of theta, or uh, I can use a cosine transform identity, say that's one plus cosine of two theta which turns out to be a slightly more useful way to look at it. Sigma theta is sigma infinity sine squared of theta, or one half, one minus cosine of two theta. And then r theta is negative sigma infinity sine theta cosine theta, or minus one half sigma infinity uh, sine of 2 theta. There we go. So in our most, in the simplest stress state, what I actually have for my polar coordinate stresses uh, is this set of uh, stresses. And so these, uh, what I, when I eventually will talk about, I guess, next week on Monday, is the stress constant, what the stress concentration around a, a circular a hole with a, a plate with a circular hole in it is um, and I'll be plotting or I'll be giving you relations for those in polar coordinates and the reason for it is numerically it makes a lot more sense to to figure these things out in polar coordinates it just makes the math a lot cleaner um, even though it's a little bit messier in the beginning okay uh, and I posted the notes for that online. I late told you section 7.3 for the manual, or for the Myers and Chala book. A couple questions. Uh, yeah. Sigma infinity. Like, if, if it was an infinite stress, would it be either like zero or infinite? Uh, it, it means the stress far away. So it's, it's sigma at infinity, not an infinite stress. Oh. So, yeah. Uh, one, two. You show the other sigmas that you find above. Yeah. So you said that that would be a useful problem in the lab. Do you know how much it is? Not sure. I'll talk it through with the TAs. I've been I've been hesitant to so actually quick quick opinion poll. If they were all due on the same day, how would people feel about that? So I, I've been having them do one week from the deadline because I, I felt like that was something that was fair, but I also don't want to have things due in the middle of the weekend. So if I were to push some of them back by, so all of them back to one of the days of the week, um, would that be fair? I think that'd be fair because the recitation happens. Happened on Friday, yeah. yeah. I feel like Monday would are just generally disadvantaged. Okay. Would anyone have any strong opposition to that? Okay. That's probably what we'll consider then. And we'll let you know what day we end up pushing it back to. Okay. Right.